Hello everyone and welcome to the session, Treatment Advances for Severe Burns and Other Complex Skin Defects. This program is provided by North American Center for Continuing Medical Education and is supported by an educational grant from Mallinckrodt Pharmaceuticals. I am Angela Gibson and I, along with Dr. Foster and Dr. Shupp will be your presenters today. We will be answering questions at the end of the presentation and encourage you to chat with us and your colleagues throughout the session. Here are our disclosures for your reference. I have received grant and research support from Mallinckrodt. Our goal in speaking to you today is to explore donor site wounds and discuss burn wound conversion. We also will investigate limitations to our current standard of care and explore new and emerging technologies for burn healing. As a burn surgeon scientist at the University of Wisconsin, I will be discussing regenerative capacity of skin throughout the lifespan, donor site challenges and complications, and burn wound conversion. These il images illustrate our skin changes over time. There are intrinsic factors such as genetics and aging and extrinsic factors like UV light, smoking, weight gain or loss and steroids that all contribute to these changes. Skin is an organ consisting of epidermis and dermis. The epidermis and the appendages located deep in the dermis are lined with basal progenitor cells that serve as regenerative centers. Their density depends on depth and the body location. Wounds heal by making more granulation tissue in the dermis and re-epithelialization from the appendages and interfollicular epidermis. Superficial burns include epidermis only and are known as first degree burns. Second degree burns can be superficial or deep partial thickness, depending on how deep into the dermis the damage is. Full thickness burns are into the fat, are third degree burns, and if it's into the underlying structures, they are fourth degree burns. Since burn depth determines treatment, we know that these depths, the superficial and superficial partial thickness, usually heal within two to three weeks. And the deeper the wound, the higher the chances that surgery is needed. Superficial partial thickness burns extend into the upper dermis. They have sufficient remaining dermal appendages that will heal by reepithelialization from these regenerative centers without surgery. Deeper burns have fewer remaining dermal appendages. And this translates into a lower likelihood of healing without surgery as there are less areas that can reepithelialize. The regenerative capacity of skin is dependent on the progenitor cells in the basal layer of the epidermis and fibroblasts in the dermis that produce collagen and elastin. With age, basal cells become senescent and they lose their regenerative capacity. Elastic and collagen fibers atrophy and decrease in number. And these changes cause the dermis to thin. Because our wound healing capacity decreases as we age, creating a donor site wound is often higher risk for non-healing. Given enough time, full thickness wounds can heal from the edges. These images illustrate the evolution of a full thickness burn that was allowed to heal without skin grafting in an 80 year old woman. This healing by secondary attention is a balance between re-epithelialization and scarring. This balance changes as we age the scarring that occurs in an elderly person is much less robust than in the young and may allow for this type of healing to be acceptable in the elderly. Since surgery requires creation of a wound, there is a balance between early excision and grafting, which results in decreased inflammation, leads to a decreased length of stay and less scarring. And the other balance is lost regenerative potential and the donor site morbidity if wounds weren't truly full thickness. This is an example of donor site morbidity. The area of the burn to the right was allowed to heal in while other areas of the burn required grafting that used to the donor site created on the left side of the back. Over time, you can see that the donor site was much more apparent than the healed burn. In children, there are challenges that are related to the smaller surface area. You have less donor site availability and there's an increased risk of conversion to a deeper burn. 
So really you have less room for error in judgment and anything that we can do to save the creation of another wound will improve outcomes. Here's an example of a four-year-old who fell into a campfire and sustained full thickness burns. She went to the operating room four days after her burn and intraoperatively she was found to have dermis remaining in most of the wound bed after excision. So it wasn't truly full thickness. This allowed us to use a mesh autograft at two to one ratio to decrease the amount of donor site needed to cover her wound. She had good graft take on post-op day three and her healing of her donor site on post-op day 10. However, at six months, there's an unsightly meshed pattern with the reepithelialization that occurred in the interstices rather than growing out from the graft. She also had hyperpigmentation of the graft and her donor site. So there is a trade-off here between the results that we have here versus one where you would get a smooth surface with a sheet graft, but that would also require a much larger donor site. And you can see here that she had quite significant donor site morbidity. While pain is a big issue for donor sites immediately after surgery and to some extent until they're healed, the itching that's associated with donor sites continues for many weeks to months after they're healed. For post-operative pain, there are many modalities available. This review compared studies on continuous subcutaneous local anesthetic infusion, injection, topical agents, non-pharmacological interventions, and wound dressings, and there was no clear evidence of superiority. Some opt to use scalp donor sites in pediatric patients because the scar can be hidden and they heal faster because of the high density of hair follicles. The study showed the benefit of actually harvesting two layers of donor site. The first harvest is a thin donor site, and the second harvest produced dermal grafts with epithelial regenerative cells, allowing twice the coverage per donor site. So that's a unique way to approach this. However, it's not always the best option for all skin types. A study from South Africa found that much higher complications with uh, donor sites were associated with kids, kids with deep, darkly pigmented skin. Complications there included folliculitis, non-healing wounds, alopecia, and visible depigmented scar and hypertrophic scarring. When patients were asked what was the most important uh, aspect to their healing, they commented that itching and topographical relief were at the top. Whereas for caregivers, they were noting pliability and pigmentation. Now I would argue that in patient-centered care, we need to focus on what matters most to the patient. So there are ways of minimizing donor site and they all have pros and cons. A widely meshed autograph can be used for more coverage with less donor site, but the trade-off is that there's more apparent scarring. It's not good for highly functional areas. Um, however, it may be better for elderly whose healing may not be associated with as much scarring. Use of skin substitutes is sometimes an option, but you, you often need dermal elements present in the wound to facilitate autologous reepithelialization. And delaying surgery up to two weeks will allow all deep partial thickness wounds that will heal in that time to heal, and that will decrease the size of donor site needing, but it increases the length of stay, and then there's a longer time before patients can return to work and different activities, as well as the pain that's associated with report, repeated dressing changes. Using thin donor sites allows for faster healing and potentially less scarring and reharvest, the ability to reharvest the donor site if needed. And this works in patients with normal dermis. However, even a thin harvest of donor sites in elderly can result in full thickness wounds if their skin is very thin. Back grafting is a unique technique that's good for elderly and poor wound healing patients, but it requires a widely meshed autograph to be used in order to back graft. A recent study comparing thin and ultra thin donor site harvests at the thick thicknesses found listed here they found healing was slightly faster in the ultra thin versus the thin donor sites. They also found complications were higher in the thin compared to the ultra thin donor or graft sites. These complications included hypertrophic scarring, infection, and seroma. And this was in contrast to prior studies that had suggested when you use a thinner donor site that you would have increased scarring. So there is some potential to decrease the morbidity associated with donor sites by taking much thinner donor sites. As I mentioned, the idea of back grafting is a unique option for the elderly and poor wound healing patients when there is the concern for creating a full thickness wound with a donor site harvest. Basically, you harvest an area of donor site large enough to cover the wound, and then you widely mesh the skin and graft half to the wound and half to the donor site. 
It is one way to think outside the box when presented with challenging patient situations. I'll now switch gears to discuss the phenomenon of burn wound conversion. It's important to review the three zones of burn injury, which include the zone of necrosis, ischemia, and hyperemia. There are multiple factors that contribute to conversion of cells in the zone of ischemia to necrotic cells. Two big factors are ischemia and inflammation. And while I feel that I see this happen on my patients all the time, there are very few studies that have been done in humans to demonstrate this phenomenon. It's really challenging to study this phenomenon in humans because burn progression can start immediately, immediately after the burn, and especially within the first few hours. And some patients do not present to our burn units immediately, uh, and they often are unable to get the care within that time frame. So this lack of human studies was evident in this recent review that looked up studies on burn conversion in the last five years. And they found that the vast majority of the studies were in animals. Furthermore, only a small proportion focused on pathogenesis with inflammation and ischemia at the top of the list. So what does burn conversion look like? This is a picture of an 81-year-old man who had a flame burn to his forearm you can see its appearance is very similar on the day of injury and two days later. However, four days after injury, you can see that the burn wound has converted to full thickness. He ultimately went on to require skin grafting. Additionally, conversion can be caused by poor cleaning that leads to infection. This is a three-year-old girl who had a scald spill to her head. She came into our, our burn unit immediately after injury and her parents were taught wound care. They felt comfortable to go home and take care of this and demonstrated the washing of her wound. However, they were unable to do that once they got home due to pain. And they waited four days to check back in with us. And what we found when she returned was a lot of pseudo eschar that had built up on the wound. The pseudo eschar just increases that inflammation and further enhances the conversion. And you can see she's converted to a much deeper burn than a normal skull burn would, would uh, require. Finally, I think it's important to point out that there's some controversy amongst burn clinicians, whether this is burn conversion or just a change that, in appearance that occurs over time. And this, this question can really only be solved by human subjects research on this phenomenon. So that includes whether we can use animal models or if we need to be using human subjects, or maybe we can take some of the data in animal models and translate it to human subjects research. Understanding when we need to evaluate this mechanism. Is this early on, immediately after injury? Uh, how long does it last? Is it up to a week after injury? All of those variables still need to be identified. Uh, it'll be interesting to look at what is the treatment of a most benefit, a topical treatment or a systemic treatment to halt the conversion. And then finally, understanding what that contribution of the necrotic tissue does to the conversion uh, basically, do we need to immediately excise the burn wound to halt any inflammation, further inflammatory cascades to halt that conversion? So as you can see, there are still a great many unanswered questions that require further research in this area. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Gibson, uh, for your presentation. My name is Jeff Shupp. I'm the director of the Burn Center at MedStar Washington Hospital Center, and I'm an associate professor of surgery at Georgetown University School of Medicine. Uh, my topic today will be the um, limitations and current standard of care for deep burn injuries and complex skin wounds. And these wounds specifically with uh, no viable dermis remaining um, after injury. So the objectives for this talk will be the o overview wounds with substantial dermal loss. And there'll be some photographs that demonstrate this uh, pretty graphically. Uh, overview the reconstructive ladder, as, as many of you are familiar with, and then review non-autologous strategies to replace the dermis in order to get these wounds to close. So as an overview, full thickness dermal injury will not regenerate. Um, it heals by contracture and wound edge re-epithelialization. Creates a huge functional loss for patients, both in range of motion, temperature regulation, sensory abilities, Excrete, uh, excretory function and uh, metabolism of some um, compounds like vitamin D. It's aesthetically devastating uh, with a lot of aesthetic loss. 
And it can cause a lot of morbidity and mortality because as these wounds contract and granulate, uh, there's a high risk of infection causing systemic uh, sequelae and inflammatory response. This was recognized very early um, and the mainstay for treatment of smaller wounds that um, lacked dermis was full thickness skin grafts. Problem with full thickness skin grafts is that the donor site or the area that you're harvesting the skin from has to have enough skin to be able to close the wound where the skin was harvested from. So in most cases, this is limited to a few centimeters. And you can see the graphic at the bottom panel showing the difference between a split thickness skin graft, which is used in a lot of burn care, and a full thickness skin graft. Full thickness skin graft is taking with it the majority of the dermis, if not all of it, whereas a split thickness skin graft is only capturing the very uh, top of the dermis and mostly epidermis. So this is a patient with a 98% TBSA burn. Um, there was no um, partial thickness injury, unfortunately, meaning that all of the wounds uh, uh, destroyed the dermis on this patient. Um, in this image, you're seeing um, partially excised or removed burn wounds that have been temporized with cadaveric allograft, which is this uh, tissue here that you're seeing. Um, up here, the cadaveric allograft um, has uh, desquamated, leaving behind um, the decellularized dermis from the um, cadaveric donor. This patient unfortunately had abdominal compartment syndrome as a sequelae of burn shock and the resuscitation that was required and that's why their abdomen is open and covered with vicral mesh, which will also become a problem in coverage of wounds. This is another patient who uh, had uh, a cooking related injury whereby the sleeve of his uh, shirt caught fire from grease and it took a long time for the patient to get the burning uh, garment off of him and resulted in full thickness loss of all of the skin elements. And you can see after excision, what is left. In some areas, this is fascia over the biceps muscle, and then this is dehydrated fat. In some areas, you can see viable tissue, but it is no longer any element of skin on this wound. So there's no way to close this with full thickness skin grafts. Um, there would be not enough uh, tissue to be able to provide coverage. Another example of a very large TBSA burn, you can tell by how swollen the extremities are and the fact that this patient had to have escarotomies that all of these wounds are full thickness. So once the burn tissue is removed, you'll be left with the, uh, subcutaneous tissue and fat. Uh, both of which have poor regenerative potential and needs to have some sort of strategy in enabling um, closure of the wounds. This is another picture of a patient with devastating full thickness injury, um, not as large of a total body surface area, but a very functional area with the bilateral lower extremities er, uh, injured. Uh, again, the patient had escarotomies to allow for expansion of the soft tissues, but Largely, the majority of these wounds will be fully excised down to fat or fascia, and on the right uh, extremity will need amputation and then limb salvage to uh, maintain length of the residual limbs so that prosthesis can be uh, accomplished. This is what the removal of that tissue looks like, tangential excision under tourniquet. You can see the tourniquet's placed here on the upper thigh and we are sequentially removing the non-viable tissue. And as I mentioned, we're down to fat, and in some cases, fascia on the left lower extremity. This is after excision, we're getting hemostasis, but this image is demonstrating um, the lack of dermis on the entire limb, except for the foot, and the need for some sort of reconstruction to enable uh, grafting with split thickness skin grafting or some other autologous tissue. So here's the reconstructed ladder that's taught to most surgical residents and plastic surgical residents and starting with secondary healing followed by primary closure or, or removal of the tissue and raising of flaps and closing uh, primarily uh, split thickness skin grafts or partial thickness skin grafts, full thickness skin grafts, 
what's missing in the latter are dermal substitutes, which I'll be talking about later in this talk, rotated muscle flaps, and then free flaps, which are um, when you remove um, composite tissue, sometimes even muscle and fascia, from one area of the body on an arterial supply that then you can reanastomose in a different area of the body. And the patients that I've shown you so far, uh, free flaps would be very difficult to use to accomplish wound closure given how devastating the injuries were and how much of the anatomic area was involved. And those top three options are rarely um, available to us for these large injuries. Split thickness skin grafts aren't perfect because as I mentioned before, they don't transplant much of the dermis. Therefore, uh, they can be prone to contracture um, and uh, scarring. The newest technology is regenerative dermal suspension. Um, this is a spray on skin technology whereby you can take a small piece of split thickness skin and expand it approximately 80 times the surface area of which you've harvested. The problem with this is without dermis in place, you have to use a conventional split thickness skin graft construct um, down first on the wound and then spray the dermal suspension. It needs the, uh, it needs the construct of the widely meshed split thickness skin graft to achieve wound closure on uh, wounds that do not contain dermis. I mentioned before in the first case that I showed you that cadaveric allograft or cryopreserved allograft can be used um, in, in uh, decades previous. Uh, most burn centers would have to have their own skin bank whereby they'd harvest from um, uh, funeral homes and from uh, medical examiner's offices uh, skin from patients who were skin donors. Then they would bring that skin back and cryopreserve it and freeze it um, so that then they could use it in their operating rooms to temporize wounds that lacked dermis. Sometimes, as I showed you in that first picture, the cadaveric split thickness grafts desquamate, meaning the viable epidermal part that had the cells that were still viable from cryopreservation would get rejected by the host and would leave behind an acellular dermis that then sometimes you could split thickness skin graft on top of without removing it. And then there are off-the-shelf dermal replacement products for which I'll show you some case series. One is BTM and the other is DRT. This is a little overview of, of how we harvest and mesh split thickness skin grafts. You need enough donor site to be able to do this as when you're harvesting split thickness skin grafts, you're actually creating more wounds on the patient. So you have to be very careful not to make the patient become more sick by increasing their total wound burden by creating donor sites. To achieve expansion, so meaning that the donor site that you harvested from can cover an area much larger than itself, you must mesh the split thickness skin graft. And uh, you can see in the bottom panel, the little intercees or holes that are created by the skin grafting mesher and these are done in ratios of one to two, one to three, one to four, and sometimes up to one to six in order to allow for a six-fold expansion of um, the, the skin you've harvested. Um, most people would say that the thinner the graft, the more propensity it has to scar, especially if you're putting it on a wound that contains very little dermal elements because the dermal construct within the wound that you split thickness skin graft um, doesn't have enough um, dermis to uh, create a scarless uh, healed wound. This is an example of a patient that has two to one mesh split thickness skin grafts over the anterior chest and then one to one meshed or one to 1.5 mesh split thickness skin grafts over the neck. Um, and this uh, shows you the, the holes, the intercies that um, the expansion of the split thickness skin graft creates. Regenerative epidermal suspension, as I mentioned, um, uses a small donor site um, and it's a point of care technology. So in the top panel, uh, split thickness skin graft is harvested. 
it's then placed into this incubator chamber with a cocktail of enzyme solutions that disassociates the skin cells from one another. And then in this point of care kit, you disassociate the skin cells further mechanically with the scalpel. Then you strain them in a strainer to get the non-cellular tissue and the bulky connective tissue uh, free from the solution. And then you aspirate the solution and spray it onto the wound. Unfortunately, in this image, this wound contains dermal elements. So it's probably a mid partial thickness burn and it's being sprayed on directly. If this were a wound that contained no dermal elements, so basically you're looking at fat, you would have to use a widely meshed conventional split thickness skin graft and then overspray with the res. Allograft or homograft is cryopreserved. It has some viability, but it depends on the source and even lot to lot variability. It's a limited resource since it's donated tissue and um, it's hard to uh, have available at some centers because it needs to be stored at minus 80 degrees right before use. And thawing the tissue is a very important process because if it's thawed too slowly, um, the crystals formed in the tissue could lyse the cells that remain viable. So you would lose the advantage of having some viability. And the, some think that having cells that are actually viable in the allograft um, entices wound healing. They help release um, pro-angiogenic and pro-proliferative um, cytokines and help prepare the wound bed uh, more expeditiously for definitive closure. This panel at the bottom is demonstrating desquamated allograft and you can see that there's still a mesh pattern here and this is the decellularized dermis from this graft that's left behind. And this can be a very viable wound bed to use for split thickness skin grafting once it all um, vas <clears throat> excuse me, vascularizes. DRT has been on the market for a long time now um, and many people are still finding uh, strategies for utilization. It is made of bovine collagen and shark glycoaminoglycans. It is off the shelf, stable at room temperature. The problem is you can't immediately, or it's not as easy to immediately split thickness skin graft on this uh, DRT. Um, it's better to wait for it to vascularize so that there's enough um, blood supply for the split thickness skin graft to survive. Uh, maybe coupled with newer technologies, um, this might be accelerated. Uh, the benefits of this dermal substitute is it does allow for good cosmetic results and good pliability. So it limits and uh, reduces the risk of fibrotic changes and scar contracture. And some people use this for scar revisional procedures whereby they excise scar and functional areas, graft with DRT, uh, wait for a week or two for it to vascularize and then uh, close the wound with a split thickness skin graft. And in most cases, uh, this has an aesthetic appearance of a full thickness graft or a rotational flap. Here is a case of a, a patient who uh, had necrotizing fasciitis of the left lower extremity and perineum. He was taken at an outside hospital for uh, life-saving debridement and then transferred to our regional burn center for large wound management. Um, you can see that most of the fascia has been removed from the, the quadriceps and the uh, gastroc and other muscles of the calf and the saphenous venous uh, system has been removed um, from the medial area of the ankle. And you can even see that the process caused epidermolysis of the surrounding uh, unaffected part of the leg. This is using the dermal regenerative template. Um, you can see that we have meshed it to allow for uh, exudate to flow through. It has a silicone sheet on it that uh, will eventually be removed, but you can see the, the uh, markings on the silicone sheet. This is not immediately upon application. This is at, week, at the end of one week. And you can see how the, the 
clear yellow uh, construct has now become pink in many areas. And this is from the neovascularization of, uh, of the material. Here it is at day uh, 10 after grafting. And you can see there's even bleeding coming from the material and uh, vascularization seems to be going very well. We take these patients back to the operating room serially to make sure there aren't infections um, as under these especially overlapped areas, uh, infection um, can become a problem and actually uh, uh, cause loss of the dermal regenerative template. Here you can see the product with the silicone removed now. It's much, has a much more shiny appearance. The other view of the other side of the leg. And here we have done uh, three to one and four to one meshed split thickness skin grafts over the dermal regenerative template. This is right immediately after the grafts have been placed. Another view of the leg. This is at dressing takedown. So you can see we're gonna have a little bit of a wound here over the patella, um, but all the grafts appear to have been um, remained in place. Notice that we achieved this without tons of staples or hundreds of sutures. Um, if, if you have a great wound bed and a good dressing strategy, most split thickness skin grafts will stay just where you put them without a lot of extra um, uh, accessories and stabilizing things like staples and sutures. You can see how it's drying out now. The interstices are re-epithelialized, although they're not repigmented, so you still see the mesh pattern of the grafts, but you can see how dry the wounds are as they're re-epithelializing the contour up to the knee is maintained. And there's not as big of a defect here from the unaffected area of the leg to the area that was removed. Here is this area that we kind of knew was going to be um, a wound over the, over the patella, but you can further see now how the, the leg has a dry appearance to it. The interstices of the graft are starting to blur as pigmentation returns to the areas that were meshed. And here we are in late follow-up. Um, most of the interstices have closed in and repigmented, and the cornification of the epidermis is starting to become very robust. You can see these areas that are flaking off. And here it is in even later follow-up. We left this wound closed uh, on its own and it, um, it did not take as long as we would expect it. But you can see the contour of the patient's leg here, much improved um, based on the, that picture from uh, when we received the patient. The other product I was going to focus on is BTM. This is not biologic, it's synthetic. It's also ready to use. And it, in, in these cases, it fills a similar niche to, to dermal regenerative template. Um, many people have anecdotally um, found this product to be uh, less likely to succumb to bacterial infection, which, which is good in some wounds that you just cannot get the bio burden reduced uh, and need to get the wounds closed. So in the future, with the two strategies I outlined, um, we have the dermal substitutes. They both seem to work uh, similarly. <clears throat> they take a while to revascularize. So the closure of the wound is not instantaneous. We also have cultured epidermal autographs, which have been around since the 70s. Uh, they might be mentioned in one of my colleagues' talks, but uh, basically you send a small biopsy of a patient's uh, non-injured skin to a laboratory, and they isolate keratinocytes and grow epidermis into sheets that you can use for grafting. Doesn't fix the problem of loss of dermis. So hopefully in the future there might be a way to combine similar technologies such as CEA with some of the technologies that I showed in thermal substitutes to have a completely bioengineered uh, piece of skin that would then be an off-the-shelf full thickness skin graft. Thank you Dr. Shupp. Uh, my name is Kevin Foster. I'm a burn surgeon at the Arizona Burn Center in Phoenix, Arizona. And it's my pleasure to present to you Innovations in Skin Grafting. 
And we're going to spend our time talking about three different uh, products that have really changed the face of the surgical management of the burn wound over the last uh, decade or so. Uh, I do have a disclosure. Uh, the three products that we're going to talk about, uh, I have participated in uh, research studies uh, with uh, the companies that manufacture each of these uh, three products. So we'll talk a little bit uh, first about regenerative epithelial spray, a skin spray, a true keratinocyte spray, and then about a true um, bilaminate skin substitute, BRSC, and then a uh, dermal substitute called BTM, which is the, the newest uh, uh, product. So let's start off with the regenerative epithelial uh, spray. So this is a, an autologous cell harvesting device that's uh, really designed to prepare a, a keratinocyte spray from the patient's own skin. And the way we start off doing this is we take a very small skin graft, it's about the size of a postage stamp, and we generally take it a little bit thinner than we do for most donor sites, so it's usually six to eight one thousandths of an inch in, in thickness. And then this skin sample is incubated in warm trypsin uh, for about 20 minutes. And what this does is it separates the dermis from the epidermis, and it separates the epidermal cells from each other. So essentially you end up with a, a little pile of individual epidermal cells. And if you look at the bottom right-hand uh, uh, part of the, the center column, you can see that we also do a physical separation where we separate the epidermis from the dermis using the scalpel and, and forceps. And then the, uh, the cells are suspended and filtered and then resuspended into a syringe, and then a little plastic cap is put on it. It's pretty low tech, this part of it. And then the, the keratinocyte spray is, is ready to go. It's very quick and very easy. And uh, once we have gotten used to doing this, it adds absolutely no time uh, to our operative time. And this is kind of what it looks like in, in real time. Uh, this is the little device here. And uh, the surgeon here is, uh, is physically separating the epidermis from the dermis. And you can see the syringes in the top right-hand portion of the table. Those just have little caps put on them, and that becomes the, the spray. So uh, initially, there was an FDA trial in uh, 2010 to uh, work on uh, getting FDA approval for this product, and it was a very simple trial comparing uh, the RES uh, um, uh, epithelial suspension to uh, two-to-one skin grafting. And then uh, we had an interesting experience, which I'll tell you about in just a second, and then there was a change in the protocol. And then there's kind of a change in how this, uh, this product uh, was ultimately approved and is now being used, at least in the United States and Canada, and I think it's starting to spread uh, elsewhere. So this is a short schematic of the original study. The original study basically took a small wound, divided it into two uh, parts, and uh, one part of the wound was sprayed with uh, the RES. You can see that would be distal down by the wrist. And the other part was treated with two-to-one mesh, which you can see that's kind of up by the elbow. And what we found in our, in our portion of the study is that sometimes the grafted area looked better, sometimes the sprayed area looked better, but the part that almost always looked the best was the part where there was a graft with a little bit of accidental overspray. So somebody on our team, and it wasn't me, but somebody on our team came up with the idea of, you know, why aren't we using this uh, when, we, when we do big burns and we have widely meshed autograph, why don't we spray this over the top of it? And we thought that was kind of a good idea, theoretically. And then um, a few years back in the fall, a young couple, uh, um, a boyfriend and girlfriend, came home to their house in, uh, in Phoenix, Arizona, and unbeknownst to them, it was filled with natural gas. There was a leak, and natural gas in, in, in our area does not have uh, a smell or, or an odor to it, so they didn't know about it, and they uh, went to light a candle, and the whole house blew up. And so these two young people came in with very large, deep burns, and um, again, somebody on the team had the idea of why don't we try using the, the spray over widely meshed autograph. Now, it had not been approved by the FDA at this time, so we petitioned the FDA to use it in a compassionate use protocol outside of approval, and we got, we got approval to do that. <clears throat> and it turned out it was a big success on these, on these patients. Not only did we use widely meshed autograph on their burns that had to be excised, but then we also sprayed it on the donor site. And we're looking at uh, 
at uh, um, the donor site of the young man in question right here, and this is just after we harvested it. And this is about uh, two weeks after we had sprayed it, and this is about a month after we had sprayed it. So you can see these. this is a really, really tremendous result. And that kind of uh, changed the way that uh, the company decided to try and get approval. We changed the protocol. We started doing this compassionate use protocol around the country, and uh, over 100 patients have, have been enrolled in it since that time. And uh, this product was um, approved for use uh, a little over two years ago, and it has really changed our method of, uh, of taking care of, uh, of burn patients. Um, not only do we use it uh, frequently on widely meshed uh, autographs, but we use it on donor sites, and we're starting to use it in different types of patients, like necrotizing fasciitis patients and things like that. And what we do know is that it, it helps uh, with widely meshed autograph. We're able to do more at one sitting, and um, we're able to get the donor sites to heal quicker so we can do repeat surgeries sooner. So we can do larger sooners, larger surgeries closer together, which ultimately means in a decreased length of stay. And we've demonstrated that, that not only does it decrease length of stay, it also decreases the costs of it. And so um, we really think that this has, uh, has changed how we do large percent total body surface area burns. So um, as I said, it was uh, approved for use. Uh, and these are sort of the indications that we've already talked about. And we're starting to um, use it on um, superficial to partial thickness burns just following debridement instead of using a biologic dressing, and we're starting to use it in the outpatient setting for acute and chronic wounds outside of burns. So this uh, is very interesting technology. It definitely is an interval improvement in the surgical management of the burn wound, and I think you're going to see a whole lot of, um, of, of this in the future. Okay, we're going to shift gears a little bit and talk about BRSC skin template. Uh, now, um, the, uh, a true bilaminate skin substitute is the holy grail of burn injury and the surgical management of the, of the burn wound. And this kind of lists the, um, the uh, advances that we've seen in burn surgery, the, the innovations over the decades. So, you know, if you go back to the 50s, then we, we have antibiotics, and then the 60s we have resuscitation, and then working our way up to, you know, a decade ago, we were really concentrating on dressings, particularly on silver dressings. And now I think what we're really looking at is how can we, how can we find a skin substitute? How can we, you know, take this three or four month, uh, you know, experience in the hospital uh, getting grafted and, and make that, and make that better? And probably one of the leading candidates for a true skin substitute is this BRSC. It is, an, it is a true bilaminate skin substitute. It's made of an epidermis of uh, human keratinocytes from an immortalized cell line, and it's made up of a murine-generated dermis that is cell-free, but it has fibroblasts and collagen, and histologically it looks very much like a human uh, dermis. Uh, and the keratinocyte cells have been extensively tested. They are, uh, they are safe, they're non-tumorgenic, they're pathogen-free. And the last bullet point here, you can see they can be genetically engineered without the use of viruses, which is really very interesting. I'm not going to talk about that aspect of this, but it's something I think that's really important to keep in the back of your mind, that we could actually genetically engineer these skin cells to do cool things like make antibiotics or make growth factors or, or things like that. So uh, the uh, uh, histology of the skin, if you look on the right-hand side of this slide, as I said before, looks very much like human skin. You can see a keratinized uh, epithelium followed by epidermal cells followed by dermal cells, and it looks uh, very much like human skin. Uh, this is just a, a slide uh, demonstrating that um, that, they, that these cells can be engineered to make uh, these things called beta defensins, which are defense peptides. Uh, and again, we're not going to talk too much about that now. This is what it looks like. Um, it looks very much like regular skin. Uh, it uh, looks like a uh, normal skin graft, and it can be, it's pretty durable. You can mesh it, you can fold it, you can move it around. It, it's not particularly. Um, uh, uh, fastidious, it's very uh, durable, uh, and it can be made in, in, in very large uh, um, batches if, uh, if need be. 
And so the, the first use of this was really in patients with um, deep burns who were going to get excised and then allografted and then subsequently autografted. And the patients were randomized into getting either uh, the BRSC or allograft, and then a week, about a week later, they underwent autograft uh, placement. And if you look at uh, the allograft versus the BRC, as you can see on this slide, they look very, very similar. So the BRSC actually uh, worked very, very well. It, um, it adhered to the wound, it became vascularized, and then ultimately it would, uh, it would fall off if you left it on uh, long enough. Um, but we did not leave it on particularly long. We only waited for about a week, and then we removed it and then autographed the patient. And then ultimately, um, the patient's autographs did great. So there was no difference uh, between um, patients' outcomes, uh, whether they received allograft or the BRSC. And we, we looked at a whole variety of, of outcomes. And uh, that study demonstrated that it was basically – uh, equivalent to um, uh, allograft. And the one thing, and this is, the, this is a, the reference here for that particular study. And then the, the one thing that I really wanted to do and that our team wanted to do at that time was we wanted to leave it on and see what would happen. And that was the subsequent study, and that's this study right here where patients were randomized, patients with partial thickness burns who needed skin grafting were randomized to get the uh, BRSC or they uh, had normal uh, autografting. And um, I'll just jump to the chase and say that in c the conclusions were that there were equivalent outcomes um, between patients who were grafted and patients who received uh, the BRSC. Uh, now, um, uh, the outcomes really looked at uh, healing at, at three months, uh, so it was a long outcome, but looking at those uh, uh, patients, they did basically just the same as patients who were uh, autographed. So there's a lot of really good potential for this particular uh, uh, product. And future directions, you know, can we use this in patients who have partial thickness or full thickness injuries? Can we use it in chronic wounds? And how can we uh, genetically engineer uh, this, uh, this tissue to make it even, even better? So um, this is not yet approved uh, for um, use in the United States by the FDA, but it is uh, very close, and we really look forward to, to having this particular product. Okay, third product is something called BTM, Biodegradable Temporizing Matrix, and this is a dermal uh, replacement. And if you look at the second bullet point here, it's a man-made synthetic uh, polymer, and it doesn't contain any biologic materials, and it's, it's, it's cell-free. And the reason that that is important is that um, all, of our, all of our dermal substitutes that we have right now are biologic to some degree or another, and that makes them uh, fairly sensitive to infection. And most of the people in the burn world that have um, used um, dermal replacements have had the experience of putting a lot of biologic dermal replacements on patients with large percent total body surface area burns, and then having that get infected, and, and then it all becomes infected, and then it all has to come off, and, and then it's, the, it's a mess, and the patient gets set back by uh, several to multiple weeks in their, in their hospitalization. So that's sort of the thing that makes this a little bit uh, different. And it, it, histologically, it kind of looks like this. It's actually polyurethane uh, in a lattice structure. And then uh, the, uh, the very outside is a, um, is a sealed layer that does not get absorbed. The polyurethane in the deeper layer does, in fact, get absorbed uh, eventually, but the outer layer does not. So it kind of acts like, a, like an epidermis. And you put this into the wound, and you allow cells to infiltrate into the scaffold, uh, which serves as a, as a sort of a template, and then the scaffold structures get reabsorbed, the outer layer stays intact and sort of protects everything from infection, and then you take the outer layer off and then uh, treat the wound how you normally would, which would typically be skin grafting. And this is what it looks like. Uh, obviously, it's polyurethane, and so you can make huge, big sheets of it, and it does come in a variety of sizes. It's very easy to store. It's very easy to use. Uh, it's very user-friendly. Uh, and these are the current indications for it, as you can see. 
Uh, we've spent, uh, obviously, most of our time looking at it in, in burn wounds, particularly in patients with large percent total body surface area burns. But we've also looked at it in pressure ulcers, venous ulcers, diabetic ulcers, and a variety of other acute and chronic, uh, uh, chronic wounds. So basically, uh, the wound is excised. You need a nice, clean wound, uh, and you um, apply it to the wound bed and secure it into place, uh, however you would normally secure it, and just wait. And um, in general, the longer you wait, the better it takes, and the more successful your subsequent skin grafting is going to be. Uh, but we have used it as soon as two weeks and as long as six weeks. and. Um, and that, uh, that seems to work uh, fine. And then, um, as I said before, the outer layer uh, sort of seals everything and helps prevent infection. You take that layer off, uh, prepare the wound, and then uh, simply graft it. Uh, this is kind of what it looks like, uh, the BTM. Uh, it uh, comes in big sheets, and it is laid into the wound and secured into place. And uh, the left-hand side shows what it looks like uh, typically. Um, after a couple of days after uh, placement. And then on the right uh, side of the photograph, you can see the top part of the wound. Uh, we've had uh, 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 autographed available, and so that patient is now being autographed there. And the BTM on the bottom pa uh, part of the photograph is still staying in place for a later, uh, a later date. So, and this is uh, what the end result is. It tends to be, um, you know, satisfactory. Uh, and so it, uh, it works well. Um, there are no biologic components, so you don't have to track it. It doesn't have to be frozen. Um, it's easy to access it. You just take it off the shelf, open it up, cut it to size and configuration and secure with staples or sutures or even uh, uh, fiber and sealant. And uh, it's relatively uh, affordable. Um, uh, you can graft when ready. One of the really in interesting things about BTM is it seems to, number one, be resistant to infection, and number two, easy to treat when it does get infected. And in fact, uh, you can treat just uh, the local area that's been infected without uh, having to worry too much about the entire uh, um, BTM uh, becoming in infected. So that makes it a little bit different than most of our other dermal replacements, and it's probably one of the real advantages of it. <clears throat> so it's important that all of the burn gets excised. If you leave burn behind, it tends to be a nidus of infection. Um, it's a good idea to um, debride this just prior uh, to BTM application, even if you've already excised the wound. It's good to put it on a little stretch so that it's in contact with the underlying wound. And then we usually bolster it and splint it and put pressure on it to make sure that it stays in contact with underlying uh, tissue. As I said before, infection does not mandate removal of all of it. You just treat the infected area. And um, you can leave it on for as little as two weeks. And we, we have done this multiple times, and we've had some success with it. So that's kind of the end of my presentation. And as I said before, these are three products, but I think that um, – that they have really substantially changed and have the potential to change even more uh, the surgical management of, of patients with, uh, with burn injuries. So on the left, we have a keratinocyte spray uh, that's very easy to use and is uh, commercially available now. In the center, we have a true bilaminate skin substitute, which uh, should be available very soon, and uh, I'm sure we will all find uh, new and unique ways to, to use that. And it has uh, so much potential with the genetic engineering. So there, there is a lot more to come with this product. And then finally, on the right-hand side, we have a new type of uh, dermal replacement, which I think has substantial advantages over uh, the existing products that we have here. So from a burn surgeon perspective, this is an exciting time, uh, lots of good, fun products, and ultimately, uh, patients are going to do better and have done better because of that. So I think I will stop here. Uh, thank you so much for this opportunity. So thank you all very much and be safe.